Hi. Hi. We're going to get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm uh, Matt Turk from First Mark Capital. Uh, as always, many thanks to Bloomberg uh, and the great events team for uh, hosting us in this uh, amazing uh, place. Uh, always very excited. Um, so we have a uh, very interesting event tonight. So as, as you guys know, for those who come here on a fairly regular basis, uh, I try to organize events by themes. Uh, and the theme tonight is intersection between data and, and commerce. So if you think about some of the most vital functions of, of commerce, uh, whether that's customer service or supply chain visibility uh, or prediction of what your customers are going to do and how they're going to behave, uh, we have a bunch of vendors, uh, uh, exciting startups who are vendors in the space uh, that offer great solutions. Um, so we're going to proceed in, in reverse order. Uh, so Ian from uh, Sales Through, uh, it's all about personal Personalization for commerce. Jordi, it's about uh, sales service, about customer service. Uh, Josh from Pangeva, uh, that's going to be about supply chain visibility. Corey uh, at Costora offers uh, a, a, a predictive uh, analytics uh, solution for e commerce uh, vendors. But we're going to start with VJ, um, who's uh, the resident practitioner in the in in the house if you will um, the other guys offer solutions vj is uh, you know part of the uh, group of people that actually need to make stuff actually happen uh, so we're excited to have you and uh, we're going to start with you right away is this on hello perfect do i just use this for the hey guys Okay, so I'm Vijay Subramanian. Well, Vijay is uh, half my first name. I don't think you want to know the second half. Uh, I'm the chief analytics officer at uh, Rend the Runway. And normally I would have my name on the slide, but I didn't want to destroy this beautiful image, which I get to start with. So um, anyway, anywho, so Rend the Runway, for those who don't know, is a fashion e-commerce startup uh, dealing in uh, rental of designer goods. So we rent designer dresses, accessories, handbags, et cetera. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about data and analytics at Rent the Runway. But before I even get to that point, I actually wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about how are consumers consume our product, because I want to really explain uh, you know, who's the consumer, what do they do on the website, and that will really set the foundation for data and analytics at Rent the Runway. So starting with that. Okay, so the process actually, you know, conceptually, it is very simple, and it should be, right? You come to the website, uh, we have a whole catalog of inventory that you can rent, uh, and the two key variables we need from you are a date, the date that you want the product to arrive at your doorstep, and the location, sort of where you live. So if you give us those two, and actually size as well, I mean, if you're renting dresses, we need to know what size you are. So if you give us these few key variables, we can figure out what kind of inventory is available for you to rent, uh, and that's going to show up at your doorstep. But before that, you know, obviously, you're going to browse, you're going to find what you like, uh, you're going to transact, and then boom, it shows up at your doorstep. You open up the package. Uh, you, know, you, you, you actually may have gotten two dresses because you want to be sure. Uh, there also is a uh, handbag over there, and also a prepaid envelope for you to drop the dress back to us. So, so that's sort of the process. Then you try it on. Uh, you feel really good about it, you take a picture, send it to your friend if you want to get feedback, and then you add it to your event, and then you actually come to our site and you actually post a review. You actually upload a picture of you. And this actually is a very commonly used feature for us. People coming to the website organically, posting pictures, talking about the event, writing reviews, which is really consumed a lot by users when they actually browse and navigate and I want to discover products. So after all of this amazing event that you've had, uh, you take the dress, as it is, we put it in the mailbox, anywhere, and it comes back to us, we take care of the rest. So that's basically the business model, right? Rental of designer luxury products, uh, easy peasy. Now, behind this fairly simple conceptual use case, uh, there's a lot of interesting problems that data is helping solve. So I wanted to give you a flavor for what these problems are. Uh, so first one, is the fairly sort of classical problem of product discovery. You know, how do users find products? Uh, the thing for us that's a little bit unique is that uh, as a rental business, we don't make money on the first rental, right? So I mean, the dresses have to go through many life cycles of rentals for us to make money. 
So the dressers have a fairly longer life cycle than a traditional e-commerce fashion retailer. Uh, so our catalog is basically growing all the time, right? We, we have dresses from a few years ago. We have dresses that are new. We have a pretty broad catalog. Also, we're catering to a very wide variety of events. People are renting for prom, for weddings, for New Year's Eve, for holiday parties, for charity events, concerts, uh, Kentucky Derby. So there's all kinds of events that are in the flow. So it's pretty important for us to make sure that we can match the user to the product as fast as possible through the lens of events. So we spend a fair amount of time trying to figure out how do we do that. Uh, the second angle that actually I think is kind of unique to us is sort of what I call the Netflixian angle, which is we actually want users to discover the long tail of products. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but back in the day when Netflix was doing DVDs, uh, before it became Quickster, and I don't know what happened there. But in, back in the day, when they, when they had a new release show up, tons of people would, would actually want the new release. Now, Netflix couldn't possibly buy enough inventory to, to satisfy that demand, so it was in their best, best interest for you to discover some cool indie flake or some classical movie or some old movie so that they could still satisfy your demand and throttle the, the, the high demand for new products. So for us, it's kind of very similar because there are some dressers that are renting all the time, it's booked out, and we want to make sure that we can find something that is similar to that, that's a little bit more available for the, e for the event and for the weekend that you're going out for. So, you know, this problem, I mean, again, it's sort of classical problem of product discovery, but there's a couple of angles here for us that are very important. Uh, we've been working on this for actually about a year now. Uh, we started off with sort of traditional item-based collaborative filtering, uh, which we used because we were trying to solve the problem of making sure if, if you love something which is not available, can we find something that you like that you would kind of would be second choice but still good enough for you to rent for that event? Uh, and now we're actually evolving into doing sort of user level target recommendations for knowing what your event is, and we're using basically matrix, uh, matrix factorization for that. So this is an area that we're going to continue to focus on. It's super important for us in order for users to find the right products for the right events. The second problem that uh, we face is will this dress actually fit me? Not me personally, I don't actually wear dresses. Uh, will this fit the user? Uh, now, you could also argue this is sort of a classical problem any, any e-commerce or battle retailer faces, right? But for us, again, it's a little bit more accentuated because remember, people are getting this dress right before their event, right? So it's not like you can just get a bunch of shoes or a bunch of dresses, try them on, return half of them, and move on, right? This is coming before the event. So it better fit you, right? So, the, so the, the barrier is much higher. So we have tried to actually solve this problem by using the user content. I mean, users are already reviewing the dress. They're posting pictures. So we've just essentially tried to build uh, tools on top of that data to surface that as fast as possible. So you can come and then you can search for people like me. You can say people who actually look like me with my kind of body type, uh, my bust size and my, my waist and my hip size see what they actually wore for what events, and they actually can see that while they're browsing. And it's a remarkably successful feature. It actually is used by, by a lot of our transactors. Um, now, we're going, to keep, we're going to keep working on this problem, right? By the way, I use the word uh, fit in capital zero because if you look at a lot of the companies out there, vendors who are working on fit, they're focused a lot on the sizing problem. Uh, that's a whole other topic of conversation for me. But sizing, I think, is one part of the problem. I actually think it's only 30% of the problem. The bigger problem is, does this dress work for me? Does it actually fit me? Does it flatter me? And I think they're missing the mark by focusing too much on sizing. Anyway, so what we're going to figure out is like beyond sizing, can we really make sure we can match the right user with their body type to the right product? Now, a third problem uh, we, we work on is uh, buying, inventory buying in the first place. Again, you would think it's a very traditional retail problem. Everybody needs to buy inventory. What do you buy? Uh, for us, again, it's just that much more accentuated because we can't make that many mistakes. We don't make money on the first rental, right? So the dress has to turn enough times for us to make money. So if we, don't, if we make mistakes in buying inventory, we'll never make money on that dress, unlike a retailer who at least can discount it and kind of sell out of that stuff at some margin, right? So here's an example, right? I mean, I literally just went in, I picked a bunch of randoms in the last two years. It's not that easy. Can you spot what did well and what didn't do well? By the way, it's a really hard problem. I thought it would be easier than, than what it turned out to be. The way we approach this problem is we've done basically a lot of tags. We just have the, the, the merge team go crazy. They have about 50 to 65 tags actually on the website, you know, in the back end for these products. 
We try and we, we try and run a regression on it. We try to see all combination of attributes. We're trying to find is there pockets of attributes that actually do really well and do really poorly consistently over time, and we just try to help them every season. You know, just do better, just do better. And I will concede, by the way, this is a very hard problem. I don't. I think there's a lot of noise here in the data. I think we're improving every year. Data has played an instrumental role, uh, but by no means is this problem sort of a sort of a cracked science problem here. I mean, this is very hard. Uh, okay, so the three problems I mentioned, right? Fit, product discovery, inventory buying. All three of them fairly traditional e-commerce problems, retail problems, except for each one of them there is a little twist for us, as you probably saw. But one problem that is really unique for us that I don't think anyone is, is, is working on actively is logistics, uh, something that I did not anticipate walking into this organization and this role that I took. And thankfully, I had a PhD in OR, so that kind of helped. Um, anyway, so just imagine the rental life cycle for a second, right? So the user is ordering a dress. And by the way, I actually missed a whole point over here, which is the outbound shipment from us to the, to the customer. They keep it for a little while, and then they drop it back in the mailbox. There's a transit time back to us. And after it comes back, just take a step back here. These are, by the way, really bulky, heavy dresses. They have sequins on them, beads on them, lace. This guy, I mean, and somebody could have spilled a wine stain on them, right? Like these dresses have gone through an event, basically. They come back to us. So we essentially have to, we have an army of like seamstresses repairing these things. We have people, you know, we have dry cleaners, we have spotters, we have a whole QA team that actually is smelling the dress. Like we basically have a whole, whole bunch of people trying to make sure that the next customer who gets the dress is, is a brand new dress. So there's a huge turnaround time in the process as well. So now, if you, if you look at this cycle, you know, for me, I want to make sure that I shorten the cycle as much as possible. Right? It's my best interest to shorten the cycle. The, 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 the shorter that is, the less inventory I have to buy to support the demand, basically. So literally, in the last three years, we've invested a lot of resources, engineering, analytics, into this problem in trying to make sure we can maximize turns. And we've literally built, bottoms up, from scratch, a data-driven technology platform that does this. Uh, we've done, by the way, we've done a remarkable job from, you know, you know, we actually tried to, by the way, buy this, uh, you know, off the shelf. We tried, went out, we looked. No one is doing reverse logistics in this kind of scale, so we had to build everything from scratch. So this is one interesting problem that we've, that we've solved. Now, I can't get into the details, unfortunately, but I wanted to give you a flavor for this. Uh, the second problem around logistics, so the first was just how do you shorten the life cycle? How do you get more turns? The second, actually, is around how do you take the bookings in the first place? Remember I showed you how somebody comes in, gives you a date and a size and a zip code, and we, we, we show you what's available, right? How do you do that calculation, right? If you think about it, if you want to book something for Valentine's Day right now, or let's say mid-March, you could just take the assumptions of what every single sort of cycle time is, and you could basically say, you know, well, here, here's what's available. Unfortunately, this system is fairly stochastic, right? It's not very deterministic. Customers could be late. Customers could return the dress, but the dress could actually be damaged. It might take a week for it to be repaired. By the way, heck, between now and mid-Feb, we could lose a unit of inventory just organically. We don't know where it went. It just shrink, right? So we basically have a lot of uncertainty in, in the process. So we really have had to build a very sophisticated system that actually tries to predict what the inventory is going to be in the future. Um, you know, I'm sure you've experienced where you booked a car and you've showed up, you, you booked a compact, you show up, and they say, I don't have a compact, but here's an intermediate, right? That obviously works very nicely for a commodity rental like that, but we're talking about design addresses here, right? So uh, we really have to make sure that the customer, we want to maximize the chance the customer gets the dress that they ordered. We want to minimize the conflicts of inventory. So this, in combination with the, with the previous sort of logistic systems, we've spent a lot of time trying, trying, to, trying to solve this problem using data and analytics as possible. Anyway, so... I, I want to give you a flavor for things we're solving. I mean, unfortunately, I can't get into too much detail, but hopefully you got a sense for how data touches all aspects of it, uh, from product discovery to building confidence that you actually the desk will work for you around fit. And then after that, uh, you know, actually going through all the logistical challenges that we have. Um, I, I'm going to just leave with a, just a completely very different tangential random data point because we're amongst data friends here, right? So... This is my last two slides. So I'm actually a little scared about this hype around big data, to be honest. Uh, 
Because to me, you know, I feel like a lot of the focus is really around reducing the cost of storage, retrieval, and processing, which is fantastic, by the way, because everything we do is open source. We're not, we're not paying a dime for it. We have people just crunching the data constantly. That said, what, you, what we really need, though, is we need to transform the businesses with data, right? We need to get to that level. It's only done by, I don't know, a few companies, to be honest. We have to convert the data into insights and actions and really need a seat at the exact table in order to transform everyday, everyday decision you're making via data. And, and honestly, to me, this whole hype will all be real and make sense if, in five, ten years from now, there is like C-level execs, more like me, who, are, who actually own the data function, own the science function. And if that actually happens, then this whole thing is going to be real, and we're going to be we're going to rule the world. So anyway, with that, I will stop. And I will get any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll start with a quick question, and then we'll. we'll um, so I assume you, you, you're building this super interesting data set for uh, you know designers and, and brands and all the things. I mean, all the, the the information that you gather, all the data that you gather about what works, what doesn't, what call, and all the things is is presumably super interesting to them. Is that something? That, and I don't know if it's a confidential question or not. But is that is that a, a a revenue source for you guys to sell the data to brands? Not right now. I mean, we've actually tried uh, to be honest between the four walls here. Uh, a lot of the brands don't care as much about data that deeply. I mean, they have their own sort of philosophy of how they want to design stuff. Uh, they do it six months in advance. There's this huge, ridiculous supply chain life cycle that they go through in order to, sorry, no offense. Uh, we, we, have, we have shared data with them. I mean, they find it interesting, but I don't think there's something that they would pay for at this point. Uh, so we're really using it for, for our side to make sure we're making the right choices in terms of buying. That's, that's actually super interesting. So, uh, and are you finding like any, uh, you know, within those monolithic, uh, monolithic groups, are you finding, you know, some people that tend to be like, uh, you know, more modern in their thinking and you know, evolving towards actually designing uh, products on you know, sort of data-driven data way, or or is that just like the whole? At least not in our. Right? I mean, there are some that are a little more than others, but in by in general, I don't I, I don't see a whole lot going on where they're focused that's fascinating. on data. Okay. Um, questions for Dan the. the I'll start with uh, name and company. Hi, Irina Rogowski. I'm curious what you, you talked about the open source product, or you said everything you use is open source. What software are you using? Sure, yeah. I mean, our entire uh, transactional stuff is, is on MySQL. Uh, we use Mongo for a product catalog. We use Redis to serve recommendations. We use R to do the matrix factorization. Um, did I touch everything? I think I did. Uh, we use we use tons of Python scripts for parsing the reviews. Um, that's that's about it. So I mean, pretty much our entire tech stack is uh, is open source and free. There's, there's no proprietary sort of vendor solution. I'm just thinking. I mean, we well we use uh, Rackspace for hosting the server. That's about it. I mean, we've, we've we've looked at solutions for a lot of these things. I mean, even for recommendations. I don't know if Ian is here. Uh, and I, it was I, great. I know sales was building recommendations. So, I mean, at the end of the day, only because uh, the, the, there's a nuance to us around recommendations, around uh, it's an events focus. It's not just like stylistic, right? I mean, no offense, but I mean, when, when, when people are, look, are looking for sort of what, what they want, but there is a style element to it, right? And I like, I, I'm, I generally dress conservatively or I'm edgy or I'm whatever, right? But it also is a big focus on an event. We want to make sure that we're, we're catering to that data, and, and the data is like sort of living on our systems, and we want to make sure we can exploit that. And that's why we're really trying to build that in-house to, to really exploit the data we have already about the user beyond their user behavior and, and, and the stylistic tags. Uh, that's one piece. Also, the availability is pretty important for us. The fact that not every dress and every size is available for every weekend, we want to make sure we can divert you to the next best available product that, that, we can, that you can book on. So a lot of that stuff is, a, is based on a heavy back-end system that does the calculation of availability. And again, so these are all sort of fairly proprietary systems, so we just felt like it's organic for us to own the recommendations piece, as much as Ian wants us to use theirs. And then even for fit, actually, we looked, uh, we looked at the market out there, and again, my, my feeling is that they're focused a lot on the sizing problem, and I'm not even sure, I mean, 
the biggest concern I have is a lot of the UX stuff is all like takes you out of the experience. Like you have to go in, you have to fill some questionnaire about who you are, and then it takes you somewhere else and comes back and says, "Recommend, you know, here's size four for the designer." Why? Like, why would a user actually believe that? Uh, so I just feel like our ability to use the existing content we have on the site with the reviews and the pictures is much more organic. It actually feels real. So it's, so when I say, you know, if, if you normally are a size two, uh, rent a size four in Baji Mishka, it actually makes a little bit more sense for you because I can show you why, right? So that's really why also, you know, we, we, we look very heavily at fit vendors, but we've generally, I think the industry is still very young and, and fairly mature at this point. Uh, hi, my name is Matt Kroll. I work for uh, MongoDB. Um, my question about, I have a question about the logistics part of it, though. I mean, I, I know Rent the Runway pretty well, and, you know, I've actually... Yeah, we, we used, yeah. yeah, well, actually, for my you prior job, I used to do staffing for Rent the Runway back in 2009. There's actually a guy working in Mongo who used to work on the, on, on the warehouse systems. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, but the question about the logistics system, I mean, knowing the business model, you, you know, Rent the Runway sends out a dress if someone has rented it, then they take it back in, and then the dress goes back in inventory. Um, you know, unless, and I and also understand that you guys have this system that, I guess, overestimates inventory, kind of like the way airplanes overbook flights, per se, but how is that a data science problem that you guys are solving and not simply process management when it's, you know, subtracting one from inventory, then, in, then it comes back, and then adding one back to inventory? I mean, unless you guys have an Amazon-sized distribution network, it seems like it's a, just a simple linear problem in that sense. I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, it's so when we take the bookings in the first place, it's not just a straightforward calculation of I have 10 units, I've taken three bookings, so I have seven available. It's not that calculation at all. We have to predict uh, for that given SKU what we think is the inventory going to be two weeks from now. So we're trying to understand like what's the organic loss based on the physical units in the warehouse. So if I've already turned a specific unit, if I've cleaned it like 10 times, the odds of that of me losing that unit in the next, next iteration of the rental cycle is much higher than a new unit, right? So we're actually trying to predict what inventory I'm going to be available in this size three weeks from now, four weeks from now, five weeks from now. But why so do you need actually, to predict it? Sorry? But why do you need to predict it? Because if we don't predict know in real it time, and we right? take bookings for 10 units, we're going to have a conflict of inventory. So if I, if I assume that I'm going to have 10 units, right? I have 10 units today, right, physically. And I'm taking a booking six weeks out, as an example. And if I take 10 bookings, what is the odds that one of them is going to not be available? It's a function of what's happened so far with those existing units in the, in, in the warehouse so far. So we have to have some model that actually tries to predict what is the odds that I'm going to have 10 units. If it's new, it's generally higher. If it's older, it's generally lower. But, what, but sort of more specifically, based on, the life, based on the wear and tear on the specific unit, what's happened to the unit, can actually see what's available. And if I only have... If I believe that I only have nine or eight available, I will not take reservations up to ten. I'm going to take it to eight or nine. I'm trying to minimize the conflict eventually for the customer. Does that make sense? Great. Okay. So, so just one last quick one because I want to keep things moving. Sure, Tony. Okay, Tony Bear with Elvum. And my question will I'll obviously be revealing my gender not just by my voice and appearance, by the but by the question, which is. How do you tag this? I mean, as a guy, I have no idea. I, I have the faintest clue. It sounds so subjective. I mean, I mean look, there's, a, there's a, basically half of the tags are just physical attributes, like length, sleeve, length, uh, sleeve uh, silhouette, color, price, designer. And half of them are just basically what the, our fashion team just made up, right? I mean, they just think these are uh, boho. I don't even know what that is, so don't ask me. So I'm just saying, like, we, we, you know, my point was, like, go crazy on the tags because the whole idea is we can figure out what actually works from the tags, right? And we don't have to constrain them in their tagging process. Uh, so, and, and actually, I learned recently that uh, Netflix does, they actually have people watching movies and having thousands of tags on movies that are completely random as well. And then, and, and then the science actually figures out what, what tags actually make sense. So it's kind of, a, I mean, I don't think I planned it that way, but I was just like, let's not constrain what the, the merchandising team actually believes. Let's have them tag stuff, and hopefully we should be able to figure out if we're good enough what tags actually work. And I will tell you, we've had some successes, but a lot of failures too. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And you you're gonna be around yeah, as well for the, okay, yeah. so if people have more questions, okay. we'll be on. Thank you. Okay.